The old premature thrust reverser. It's actually not something that's supposed to even be allowed on a plane, and it's not something that should ever happen. Watch how it gets set up. Thrust reversers are what make that really loud noise as soon as you land. Now there's different words for different planes, but thrust reversers is just kind of a general term in what we use when we're landing and help to slow the plane down. You have your engine working like this, and as you're coming in to land, instead of this blue air here propelling you forward, it gets directed and comes out the side of the engine, and that helps to slow you down. They're not something that's actually needed on a clear day like you're seeing here. We do need them on, let's say, a, an icy day or a snowy day where your wheels and your brakes are not working as they should be when you have some type of adverse condition like that. Then your thrust reversers can really be necessary, but on a normal day, you don't really need them. What they're used for is to help the brakes not have to work as hard to slow your aircraft down. So by these doors opening up here on the side of the engine, it actually helps your brakes not work as hard. The problem is in this clip that somebody sent me, the thrust reversers actually opened up and deployed before the plane touched the ground. When I saw the initial picture of it, I thought what had happened was the plane had actually hit on the ground, bounced back up in the air and looked airborne. Cause that will happen sometimes where the wheels actually touch on the ground, the pilots deploy the thrust reversers, but they hit the ground so hard the plane got back up in the air and now those thrust reversers are out. But that's not the case at all. The thrust reversers opened up before the pilot even set any of the wheels on the ground. As you can see right here, the wheels haven't touched the ground, but the thrust reversers are actually already starting to open up. There's two possibilities here. First, you could have the machine actually malfunction. That engine could have an uncommanded thrust reverser where the engine actually opens up and commands thrust reversers, even though the pilot didn't ask for it. That's one possibility. But if you look closely here on the left engine, it looks like it has also opened up. It's not very clear in this picture, but it does appear to be open. Most airplanes have something that pilots refer to as system logic, meaning one thing needs to be in place for another thing to happen. For example, some aircraft are not able to start the APU. It's that little engine in the back of the plane that helps provide electrical power and helps the plane start its engines. Some planes are not able to start that APU in the air. Some planes are, for example, you remember in the Sully movie when they came in and landed, they actually had the ability to turn on the APU in flight and that's what gave them the ability to have all their instruments continue to run. I'm starting the APU. There are backup batteries in case that didn't happen, but that's what they did and they also were using it to help start the engines in case they were going to be able to start, which obviously didn't. But the Airbus is able to do that. Some planes don't have that feature. So there's system logic in different planes. And as you can imagine, most aircraft manufacturers are gonna prevent this from being allowed where the thrust reverser opens up in flight without the plane being on the ground. As you can imagine, it'd be a very dangerous situation if you were flying along in the middle of a flight and you had one engine trying to push you forward and the other one doing this thrust reverser, meaning it's not creating power to push your aircraft forward, but actually helps slow it down. So you have one pushing you forward and one pulling you back essentially. You can imagine why that would be a major problem. So the manufacturers of different aircraft have created different system logics to prevent that from happening. So to have this one engine on the right here malfunction is possible, but to have it happen at the exact same time as this one on the left hand side is essentially impossible. I suspect what happened is as this pilot was fighting to get the plane on the ground because it looked like it was a gusty windy day. They Obviously I couldn't see how they were doing with keeping down the runway, but they were fighting to get that aircraft on the ground. So it is possible that while they were fighting to get the plane on the ground, they pulled the power all the way back and then they thought they'd hit the ground. Like maybe they thought their landing was just so smooth that they were on the ground. And in doing so, they deployed the thrust reversers here just a few feet from the ground. Now there are different variations of every plane that gets made. Different airlines will request different variations to be made. For example, uh, my airline, we have several different models of 747s, even though they are very similar in a lot of ways. There is 
different versions of them, so they don't all work the exact same. So you need to pay attention when you get onto a new plane, you can have something known as a differences sheet, and you'll review that, and you can see anything that's different on that plane from the standard plane that you're typically flying, and the pilots will typically all review that together before you go and fly. So it is possible that on this version of the 737, they had something in place which said, for this system logic, as long as the landing gear was down and the thrust levers were at idle, you were able to deploy the thrust reversers. In this scenario, if you have your landing gear down and your thrust levers all the way back at idle and your thrust reversers are able to be deployed, that could be the system logic on this particular plane on the 737. On the 747, at least the way that I was taught the systems of it, there actually has to be weight on wheels. What that means is the plane has a sensor as soon as there's enough weight on the wheels of the aircraft from the weight of the plane, it closes the circuit and it tells the plane, okay, now these features are available. For example, the APU can be turned on or the thrust reversers can be deployed because you wouldn't want to have your thrust reversers deployed if you were flying the plane like you see here. But from the distance they're at from the ground right here, it's really not gonna make a big deal. So the worst case scenario here is that the thrust went away and it just basically, they were gonna fall and hit the ground. A couple feet isn't gonna make a big deal, it's just gonna be a really hard landing, but that is a terrible habit to get into if you start deploying your thrust reversers, for example, in that plane, if you're allowed to do that, the system logic allows you to do that, be very dangerous habit to get into because once you've deployed your thrust reversers and let's say you had to do a go around for one reason or another and your plane's not on the ground, now you have another problem. The most dangerous time you can have an engine failure is actually right where this happened, on the initial climb out. That's the most dangerous time because you have nothing to trade, meaning you have no speed to trade and you have no altitude to trade. The easiest way I can explain this to you is if you're in a car. If you're driving your car and you're at the top of a hill going down the hill and your motor were to fail, you have time. You can keep rolling forward, you can look for a good place to pull over. You have time plus you have energy. You have some speed because gravity's pulling your plane down towards the ground, so you have plenty of time to figure out where do you want to pull over. On the reverse side, if you're going up a big mountain and then your engine decides to die there, you don't have a lot of speed and you have nothing to trade, so you have to make a decision very quick of what to do because if you don't pull over to the side of the road quick enough, you're gonna be sitting in the middle of a lane and then everyone's gonna be wondering why you didn't pull over. So this pilot is essentially at this point driving his plane up the hill when this happens. So the pilot is doing the right thing here. You'll notice the first thing that he did was fly the plane. He got the nose of the plane over and he started turning back towards the runway, which is the aviate and navigate. He's getting the plane to go back to where he needs to go to land, navigating the plane towards the airport. And he does all of that before he says anything to air traffic control. That is the order that you wanna do things in. Aviate, navigate, communicate. So he's flying the plane, you heard that stall warning horn go off. You heard him push, you saw him push the nose over. Then he started turning back towards the airport. Then he called air traffic control. So he's doing everything in the right sequence. And then you can hear all of the reality start to set in as he starts breathing really heavy. The other noise that you can hear is that horn going off. That's the stall warning horn, which is basically warning the pilot, hey, your wings are about to stop generating lift. That is not something that you want to have happen very low to the ground like this. It basically is happening because the pilot is trying to keep its plane from descending and try to make his way to the airport. So it's a normal habit to have. Your, your plane's not generating thrust anymore and you're thinking, okay, well, I want to stay as high as I can and get as close to the airport. But if your plane were to stall, you're going to lose a lot more lift and it's going to put yourself in a lot worse situation. So he's gonna have to keep pushing the nose of the plane over and trading that altitude for airspeed because you need the airspeed in order for your plane to keep flying. 
So luckily this happened at a high enough altitude where he was able to trade some of his air altitude to keep airspeed so he can keep his plane flying. You can imagine if this happens at 50 or 70 feet, there's really not a lot you can do. Watch the second part here. First of all, I love the fact that every pilot knows everything when you go through flight school, the most important thing is, is to maintain center line. And even though at this point, the pilot's just trying to make it to any runway, he doesn't really care, he ends up landing on the left side of the runway. But the first thing that you saw them do, is the pilot just slid over into the middle of the runway, even though he just had an engine failure. Look at where he lands here, and look at the first thing that he does, is he slides over into the middle of the runway. I love that, it just, that's great discipline to have. That's definitely a quality that you want from a pilot is that they're always trying to do the best that they can. So even though that he had landed on the left side of the runway like that, he worked his way back to the middle of the runway. That's something I love to see. Anybody can have, and I've done it plenty of times, where I thought I was gonna land on the middle of the runway and I didn't, I, especially in flight school. I was all over that runway. But even now, every now and again, I'll not land in the middle of the runway when I'm coming in. And when I do that, the very first thing I'm trying to do is get my plane, keep my wings level, but also get my plane into the middle of the runway. Because that's where you wanna be. That's what you're aiming to do every single time is be in the middle. So I love that as soon as he landed, the first thing he did is that discipline kicked in because at the end of the day, you have to only rely on your skills and your habits and doing all those things right all the time that creates that muscle memory. At the end of the day, you can't deny that the results worked out great for this guy, but there are some things I think he could have done better. You see here how he's going towards the airport, but he's not lining his nose up on any particular runway. At this point, it'd be better to get the plane over a runway so he has a place that he can be landing going straight forward. And in case he ran out of energy and fell short, he would still be over a runway. Now, I don't know which way the winds are going or anything like that, but my suspicion is that he's gonna be landing with a tailwind here because he took off going the other direction and he just made a 180 all the way back to the runway. So my suspicion is, as planes typically love to do, take off into the wind. So by landing this direction on the same runway going the opposite direction, he's probably landing with a tailwind which is not going to help his situation. I don't know how strong the winds are. Maybe the winds are calm and it doesn't really matter, but you're not going to want to land with a tailwind, especially if you have an engine failure, because it's gonna be pushing you over the end of the runway and you're gonna to have to be going a lot faster over the ground than you wanna be. You see right here with the plane flying, it gives you the illusion that the propeller is actually still spinning, meaning that you would think it's helping the plane to move forward, but that's not the case. Look as he lands here, the propeller immediately stops. That propeller is doing something called windmilling and if you've watched any of my videos, you know I'm very easily entertained. So you know as a kid, I had something like this called a pinwheel and I would run around the house to make that thing keep spinning and spinning and spinning. Essentially, the air is actually continuing to make that propeller spin. So it's the exact same thing as that pinwheel running around the house and getting it to spin is what's going on here. The plane is going down and the air that's going over the propeller is creating that spin. So the exact same thing is happening but it's not helping the plane get move forward or get closer to the runway. So the pilot is having to just trade and balance between altitude and airspeed to get himself over the runway, and he's doing a great job. But if I had one criticism for this pilot, it's gonna be right here. Listen here for the heavy breathing and the horn making a noise. So 100% I understand the heavy breathing. If I'm in his situation and I were to be recording it, you'd probably also hear me crying and whining a little bit. So 100% that I don't blame him for. That is gonna be a natural instinct when your adrenaline starts running like that 
not something you were thinking about. It's not something that you can realistically plan. It's something that we train for, but you're not going to run up there all the time into the sky and then cut your engine off and go like, hmm, I wonder if I can do it. I mean, there are probably some pilots that do that, but typically not what you're going to go do. So that part I completely understand. But something that he's doing where he's getting his plane close to stalling very low to the ground like that is not ideal. He's maybe 80 to 100 feet off the ground here and he's making some very sharp banks to get lined up with the runway. And the problem with doing that at a low altitude like that is if your aircraft were to stall, which is what that horn is saying, it's saying, hey, your wings are about to stop generating lift. At 80 feet, if you fall out of the ground at 80 feet, that's like jumping out of a window at eight stories up in the air. You're gonna be a lot of trouble. And I know that I had this illusion when I was going through flight school, if I was ever nervous or I was flying by myself and I got close to the ground, I was like, ooh, I'm safe. And I thought, you know, I'm really more safe at six or seven thousand feet than I am at a hundred feet. Because at a hundred feet, if your plane wings were to rip off or you were to stall and crash straight into the ground, that's like jumping out of a eight story building. You're gonna be in a lot of trouble. But if you're up at 5,000 feet and you were to stall your plane, well, you have plenty of time to recover and get yourself all situated and, and keep flying the aircraft or pick a place to go land. You have plenty of time. So the altitude is your friend, but for some reason, I think human nature says when you're up high, there's danger and closer to the ground, it's okay. So at this low altitude, being in that bank like that, if he stalls his plane, there's no time to recover. The nose of the plane is gonna go over and then you're gonna hit the ground. Now, all in all, he did a great job, but I would have really liked to see him line up with a runway sooner or pick this one that's directly in front of him here. He could have made a much more shallow bank and continued to get lined up with this runway instead of making the more aggressive bank that he made to get lined up on the runway that he ended up landing on. Now, I don't know if that runway is closed. And again, at the end of the day, the results were great, but you want to always, if possible, if you're ever in a situation like this, you wanna limit the amount of bank that you're doing. Because as you bank more and more and you're going slow, you have the possibility of, of something happening where you stall and fall out of the sky. So if had he just kept a more shallow bank, he would have been able to fly a little bit further and he could have just lined up with that runway and then just kind of floated it down towards the ground. He would have been probably somewhere in the middle of the runway. But either way, you're gonna to wanna to keep the bank, if you can, from not getting aggressive like that. Doing these big banks with the possibility of having a tailwind, I'm really thankful that it turned out okay. So at the end of the day, could I have done better? Well, the guy landed and we had enough energy, enough speed once he landed to get off the active runway and it looked like clear that active runway. The video ends so I couldn't really see, but it looked like he had enough power to clear that active runway, meaning it would allow other planes that were coming in to be able to land fine. So could I have done better? Absolutely not. He did an amazing job. If you enjoyed this video, check out one of these two over here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.